Hi everyone and welcome to this new video in which we continue the Windows Privilege Escalation series. So this is the second video of the series and in this video we will discuss about Windows permissions. So how permissions are handled by the Windows operating system. As you can see from these uh, titles of these headlines, there's going to be a lot of definition of terms and concepts. It's going to be a very theoretical video, so I'm sorry for that, but it's necessary. I will show so some commands on the virtual machine here, but really not that much, because this discussion is mostly theoretical to understand what are the main mechanisms that Windows uses to manage permission. However, even though these are all concepts in theory, in practice, when we will actually see exploitation techniques, this concept will be critical to know because we will exploit various concepts, we will use the concept to actually understand what is going on during the exploitation. So, I hope the video is enjoyable, I hope you get something out of it. If that's the case, please let me know, subscribe to the channel, support me, share the video with like-minded people, leave some feedback and enjoy the video. So we can start our discussion by talking about authentication, authorization and session management. Now, anytime we interact with a secure digital system, that means a digital system that has different permission roles. So you have a basic user, you have an administrator user, you have a middle privilege user and so on and so forth. So anytime you can differentiate between different users, the idea is that you always have the following three aspects, which is authentication, authorization and session management. Now, when it comes to authentication, the basic objective of authentication is to understand who you are. Every time you authenticate to a system, you are proving a certain identity. You are proving that you are, for example, Leonardo or you are proving that you know a certain secret. It's like you are proving something, you are proving an identity. This is typically done through passwords. It is not the only way. There are different ways of authenticating. For example, in your mobile phone, you can use your finger. You can use the fingerprint or you can use your face for biometrics authentication. But regardless of the way in which you authenticate, authentication is about answering the question, okay, who are you? And this is important because we have a server typically that handles a set of resources and then we have a client. The client of course wants to access those resources but before being granted on these resources the server has to understand okay is the client allowed to access them and so you have authentication. So typically this is the first thing that happens, authentication. Now after authentication and if the authentication procedure has successfully terminated, so it was a positive authentication, the server typically generates some data that gives you back, that gives it back to you, some data, that is used to track your session. So we talk about session management, because after the client authenticates, a session is established between the client and the server. During this session, the client will be allowed to access his resources without giving the password all the time. I mean, these same concepts apply also to websites. So you have your e-commerce, your Amazon, your whatever site. First, you log in with a password. You establish a session. Afterwards, for doing operation on the site, for example, for buying an item, you do not have to put all the time your information, your password to the website. You do not have to constantly keep authenticating yourself. So the idea is that a session is established. Now there are different ways of handling sessions, but there is the concept of a session. And during, while the session is alive, we find the authorization checks. So authorization checks are related to what can you do? So it comes after you authenticated, after you established who you are, then the next question of course is, okay, perfect, you are the, the user Leonardo. What can you do exactly? 
the server has to know what are your privileges, what are your authorizations, what you are authorized to access. Because the server handles many different resources, R1, R2, R3, and so on and so forth, and maybe your client is not allowed to access all of the resource, but only a subset of them, maybe only R1 and R2, not R3. So understanding what kind of resources you can access or not has to do with authorization. So typically what happens is that in the way the session is managed, if it is properly managed in the data that the server gives back to you, that you later use to say to the server, look, I am an authenticated client with this session. In the session data, there is also the information regarding the authorization checks that will be performed on the server, by the server. So anytime later during the session, you ask something from the server, you ask, for example, I want to change my password. I want to change this group configuration. I want to edit this file. Anytime you want to interact with a system, the server will check, okay, are you authenticated? Do you have authentication data? Do you have session data? More properly, session data. Okay, let's take this session data and let's check the authorization privileges that are configured in the session data, that are written in the session data. So this is like a really general concept about authentication, authorization, and session management. It is not specifically to Windows. We can find it on Linux. We can find it on web application. We can find on IoT devices. Anytime we have the concept of user roles, we also find authentication, authorization, and session management. Now, in the context of Windows, entities that can be authenticated to the system, for example, to the operating system, are called security principle. So this is like a key keyword, a key name that you need to remember. So a security principle is anything that can be authenticated by the operating system. So example of security principles are like user accounts, so like my account, your account, your friend's account, and so on and so forth. Computer accounts, which means accounts that do not belong to a specific human being, but that are used for services. For example, a database account, a MySQL account, or also threads and processes. So you spawn a process and the process has its own security principle. Now, to identify which security principle you are and to identify the different security principle, the idea is that each security principle has a so-called security identifier, which is abbreviated as SID, SID. This is like an ID for identifying the different security principles. The SID cannot be changed, it is generated upon the creation of the users or the groups or the processes or threads. And of course, they are generated by different components depending on the context. Because we have to remember that there are many different contexts in which Windows can operate. For example, if we are on a single operating system that is not connected to any networks, then the seed for local accounts and local groups is generated by a local component of the operating system, which is called the Local Security Authority, abbreviated as LSA. So this is just a specific process that runs on your Windows machine. It does not interact with the network, it just runs locally, and it manages the local security identifiers. However, a key aspect of Windows is that it can also be used in different contexts, more complex contexts, which is the context of Active Directory. So when we have an Active Directory, and I will make a specific series about it after I'm finished with this base Windows series, but when we have an Active Directory network, we are not dealing with a single computer anymore. We are actually dealing with a network of computers where there are some specific elements in the networks, some specific servers, which control everything. And these are called domain controllers, abbreviated as DC. And in the context of domain users and domain groups, this security identifier is actually generated by the domain controller. So in those cases, the management of security identifiers become more complex because of course we are not dealing with a single computer, we are dealing with multiple computers. And the cool thing about Active Directory, which is also makes it complex, is the fact that I can authenticate on a single machine 
but then I can access services on different machines thanks to Active Directory Authentication Management, essentially. So that's the idea. Now let's talk about the structure of these security identifiers because it's really important to understand. Now, this security identifier is made up of different parts and these parts are as follows. So we have an initial letter S, so it's sort of like we have strings and then we have dashes that separate the various elements. So the first is always an S, which indicates that this string is a security identifier. It is an ID for a security principle. Then there is R, which is the revision version. It's sort of like the version of the structure. And typically it has a value of one because there's only one structure used and it did not change throughout the years. So it's sort of like your version number. Typically it's one. Now after the revision, so after the revision here, which is typically one, we have this X. And this X represents the identifier authority that issued the seed. So this X is the seed of the component who generated your seed. It is the ID of the one who generated your ID. And we said that depending if you are a local account or a domain account, this is generated by different people, by different entities. For local accounts is the LSA, Local Security Authority. For domain accounts, this is the DC, the Domain Controller. Now continuing after the X, after the third, now this gets a bit more complex because we have the Y value, which is typically like multiple values concatenated together. So these are called the sub authorities. Now the sub authorities is actually, as I said, it's not one single value. It is actually made up of multiple values. The idea is that all values up to, but not including the last value in the series, collectively identify a domain in an enterprise. This part of the series is called the domain identifier. And the last value in the series, which is called the relative identifier, RID, identifies a particular account or group relative to a domain. Now this can be confusing, so let's make some example. Now consider the following seed. So we start with S because it is the ID for a security principle, so it is a seed. Then we have revision level of one, as I said. Then we have the seed of the entity who generated this seed, this SID, which is this value five represents entity authority. So like they are mapped, they, there are also like these kind of names that are easier to remember, like entity authority. Entity authority is the security principle with seed five. This is the entity who generated this ID. Then we find the domain identifier. So the identifier of the domain, which is 32, which means built in. So it is sort of like the domain that is built in into the computer. It means essentially that there is no external domain. Everything is local. And finally, 544 is the relative identifier, which means within the domain built in, the security principle I'm referring is the administrators. So this is the RID, relative identifier. Now, this was a simple seed, right? So let's consider a more complex one. And these examples are taken from Microsoft official documentation. I will put all the links into the description, so don't worry about that. If you like confuse yourself with this, just take some time to read it, to see through this example, because at first it can be confusing, but it's really important to understand. So let's consider this other SID. Now, the following SID represents the SID for the domain admins group in the Contoso LTD domain. So we are talking about a specific domain here and we're talking about a specific security principle. So how do we read this? We start from S, which just indicates that this is like a seed. Then there is the revision level, which is always one. Then we find the entity authority, which is the entity who generated this seed. It's five. Then, notice here, now we don't have two values anymore, we have a bunch of values. Now, all values until the last, excluding the last one, all these values, they identify a domain in the network. And in particular, this is a domain identifier which identifies the Contoso domain network, Active Directory. And finally, the 512 is a relative identifier that identifies a specific group or user within that domain, which is the domain admins. And the most important thing to understand is that the first part of the series, excluding the last, is the domain identifier. 
And in an enterprise network, no two domains share the same domain identifier. And the last, the relative ID, we have that within the same domain, no two accounts or group share the same relative identifier. So why is the concept of this ID a bit more complex to understand? It's because we have to remember that in Windows, especially in Active Directories, we have multiple domain networks. So we have multiple networks made up of multiple users and groups. And sometimes those groups in different servers, in different domains, have the same name. So maybe they have the same identifier, like the same 512, right? So to distinguish between them, the idea is that we have sort of like level of hierarchies. So the first three information are just related to, okay, it's a seed, it's a revision level, it's who issued the identifier. Perfect. The most important part is this one. It is, this is where it is actually identifying something. So in, a multiple, in, a, in an enterprise network with multiple domains, uh, the first thing that we have to ask is, okay, which is the domain of interest I'm actually looking for? And this part of the seed, all the values up until the last one, it identifies a specific domain. It's like, okay, it's actually this domain. And the last part identifies a specific security principle within that domain. And the seed is generated by the network in such a way that no two domains share the same domain identifier. So the domain identifier allows you to identify specific domains within an enterprise network. And the same applies for the relative identifier it's just that the relative identifier works locally. It means that you can have a, two one, a 512 here, but also here, 512, and there's no problem with that because to identify the single entity, here you, you will use a specific domain identifier, while in this other domain, you will use a different domain identifier. So by combining the information on the domain identifier and the relative identifier, you actually get a single ID across all the enterprise network. So essentially, this is the basic idea for, uh, for this stuff. And for example, the seed for Contoso domain admins is distinguished from the seeds of other domains in the same enterprise by its domain identifier. And the same thing applies to the local identifier, to the relative identifier. Now, there are certain well-known seeds. The values of certain seeds are constant across all system. They are created when the operating system or domain is installed. They are called well-known because they identify generic users or generic groups. There are universally well-known seeds that are meaningful on all secure systems that use this security model, including operating system other than Windows. So the idea is that you have a certain set of identifiers which are created automatically when you use Windows. And to some of them, they're actually labeled with specific names. How can we enumerate, for example, the seed on our system. Well, to understand the identifier for the security principle that is our user, we can use the command whoami slash user. So we go into our shell, we write whoami slash user, and we get our security identifier. So notice, as we said, let's read this. It says S, which is a security identifier, the version, the versioning version, which is one, the versioning level, which is one. Then all of this identifies the current domain and this identifies the specific entity. So in this case, it is a user. Now, if you want to enumerate all the seeds of the system, we can do with WMIC. With this command, we do WMIC, user account, get, domain, name, and seed. So this is for all the users, the seed for all the users in our, uh, in our system. So for example, we have the seed for the administrator, for the default account, for the guest, for the quick emu, for the WDA G utility account. And notice that all of these have the same initial portion. The prefix is always the same because it identifies the machine itself. So it's meaningful just to say this machine, which is the local machine, and the only thing that change is the relative identifier, it's the RID. And we have 500, 503, 501, 504, 1000. The 1000 is a user we created custom on top of the default ones created by Windows. And all this information about the security identifiers, you can go into these links, which I will, of course, put into the description. And for example, in this page, you can find a well-known SID type enumeration and essentially it tells you, okay, to five, I do this one. To, to another, I do this other. In the case, a null seed, a seed that matches everyone, a local seed, 
the owner of the seed, like all this, all this kind of mapping essentially you can find it here. And for even more information, there is this page with, which describes everything, essentially. How it work, how they are structured, essentially what I described in uh, way more detail. And um, for example, this prefix matches this authority. So the idea is that, of course, it's not useful to work with numbers, so no one remember numbers. So what they did is that they associated specific descriptions, specific labels, to well-known and used SIDs because those are used anytime we authenticate for example and uh, so like instead of talking about S1532 eh, we just say okay replicators, backup operators, print operators it's like well-known stuff and this is the list we are now ready to talk about the access token now as I said initially when I talk about authentication and session management after an authentication procedure, typically, the server has to generate some kind of session data. Now, this is implemented in Windows through the usage of access tokens. Now, upon user authentication, an access token is generated by Windows and assigned to the user. The token contains data that determines the security context of the user and is later used for performing authorization checks. So the access token essentially says that the user is properly authenticated and has a currently active session. Later on, when the user tries to do some operation on the system, like accessing some file, modifying some files and things of the sort, the operating system Windows will take the access token that was granted to the user and will check its values for performing authori authorization checks for understanding if the user is actually allowed to do that kind of thing. Now, access tokens contain the following information, the identifier for the user account, the identifier for the groups of which the user is a member, the, a logon identifier that identifies the current logon session, a list of privileges that are held by the user, an owner seed, so like you have a bunch of different, uh, of different stuff, when a user starts a process or threads, a token will be assigned to these objects. The token is called a primary token and it specifies the permission of the process or threads. So essentially, when we start a process, the process will have permissions, will have privileges that are inherited from our privileges. So we have the concept of primary token. However, it is really important to understand that Windows allows also for the usage of so-called impersonification token, impersonation token. Now, impersonation token are used to change the security context that the process owns or the thread owns. So even though by definition at the start we have the concept of primary token so that the, the process is started with our privileges, Actually, we can change that by using impersonation tokens. And there are a series of exploits that uh, go and attack a specific configuration in which we can impersonate uh, different security context. Now, here I mentioned some APIs to retrieve this information. And in the reference, I have a bunch of articles where they play around with the window API. Now, in our series, we will not delve into the depths of access token implementation and details. This is because at our level, we do not need to know these details. However, it is important to know that they exist. And later, when I'm done with this series, when I can do more advanced stuff, then maybe, yes, we can play around with these kind of things to see how things are implemented underneath. For an OSCP level target, the idea is to understand how to use the exploits and why they work. So what are the underlying implementation and mechanism that make the exploit actually work? Because that's key. So we talk about access token, now we can talk about file permissions. Now to check permissions on a file, we can use the command icalx, so ICACLS. So for example, let's say that we create a file. So I go here, I do, let's go into the desktop and I say echo, please subscribe and I write into a file, please.txt. So I write into this file. Notice that this file has been just created here. I can click on it and I get my content, please subscribe. Now, if I'm interested on, okay, understanding what kind of permissions are set on these files, I can use the ICACLS XA. I do please like this, and I get essentially an output. This output describes the base accessing rule, the base authorization checks that are performed to access the file. And it tells you 
who can read the file, who can modify the file, and where those privileges come from. So specifically here I have two outputs, but before we read them, let's go further. So the program displays ACLs, where ACL stands for Access Control List, and each Access Control List is made up of various ACEs, Access Control Entry. So here I have to write Access properly. Now each Access Control List has the following instructions. So there is a SID, an identifier, which identifies a security principle of the system, and then a bunch of permissions. Now an Access Control Entry is an individual permission rule which controls the individual permission of a security principle on a file object. So these are the following, the simpler one, so like these are, they are not fully, I'm not covering every detail on Windows permissions because it is hell, it is really hell, and just gave you the most important knowledge for starting out. So for example, you can have F, and F means full access to the file. You can read it, you can modify it, you can delete it, whatever you want. You can also have modify access, you can have read and execute access, you can have read only access, and you can have write only access. So these are really important, and essentially how do we read this output? It is saying, look, this particular security principle, that is the security principle identified by this name, which in actuality is just a seed, it's just that instead of displaying the seed for anti-authority system, we display the string which is easier to understand. But underlying Windows sees the seed, the series of bytes that represents the seed. So it says, look, if you are anti-authority system, that means if you are system in anti-authority, you can have full control over the file. And this also applies if you are built-in administrator or QuickCam QuickCamo. So like all these three security principles have full control over the file. So here I showed another example where we have a general binary, binary.exe. And essentially what happens here is that here everyone has full access over the file. Administrator has full access, users have read and execute, and authenticated user have modify access. So depending on your particular seed, depending on which security principle you are, you can do different things on the file. This is like a bit more complex than the Linux read, write, execute. The Linux system tends to be simpler to understand. Windows is always a bit more complex for one reason or another. So this is the basic idea. So for example, if for an exploit you need to modify a file, you need to check, okay, what, uh, what is my security principle? You do this with my user. Then maybe you can check your groups. So you can check your groups essentially here for their security principle here, a seed. So this is the seed for all your user, for your, your groups, the groups you belong to essentially. And then you can check, okay, do I have some privileges of, over this file? And you can do this with iCalcs. So in this case, it's uh, not desktop, but it's, I think, please. It's please.txt. You check if you have access. If you have access, you go and modify it. Understanding this is useful, for example, when you have to hijack some services. Because to hijack services, you have to modify the binary of the service. So you have to have write permission over the binary to modify it, actually. So that's the idea. And uh, there are more advanced permissions. I mean, we don't really care about that because they are not important for an OSCP level, but it's still uh, like, uh, this is not all the story. This is just the beginning. Now, if you actually want to change the permission, you can also use the iCalcs with the slash grant. So for slash grant, here you put your seed, then you put a colon, and then here you put the right that you want to grant. And here the slash T is used to set permission recursively, and the slash C that's the command to keep going in case of an error. So if you, for example, have some error in a big folder structure and you want to keep going in order to change the permission of all other files, you can do as follows. There is also the PowerShell command get ACL, which is in PowerShell this time, so we have to open a PowerShell. It's essentially the same thing, but in PowerShell. So I do this, I get, so get ACL, please. So get ACL, okay, it's a bit slow. Allow full control. So essentially it is similar, it's just that it has a different interface because it's from PowerShell. Honestly, I really like the iCalcs, so I see no reason why not to use this, it's pretty clear to me. But there is also getACL and setACL that are the PowerShell respective commands. So for file permission, your go-to is the iCalcs. Now, when we talk about this mandatory integrity control, 
This is an additional system that is built on, on top of, for example, fire permissions. And essentially the idea is that security principle have four different integrity levels. So we have system, we have high, we have medium, and we have low. Standard users, for example, receive a medium integrity level, while elevated users receive a high integrity level. Now, when a user attempts to launch an executable, the new process is created with the minimum of the user integrity level and the file integrity level. So this is important because this integrity level is both on a file and on a user. So we have integrity over the file and integrity over the user. Now, when we, for example, execute a process, what happens is that the integrity level of the process is computed by taking the minimum of those integrity level. Now, what does this mean? It means that the new process will never execute with higher integrity than the executable file. And so it means essentially that if an administrator user executes a low integrity program, that is a program that is marked by a low integrity level, then this new process will not inherit automatically the integrity level of the administrator, but rather the integrity level of the file, which in, which in this case is the low integrity level. And so this is an extra mechanism on top of the file permission that we saw previously. Now, to understand your current integrity level, you can execute the command umi slash groups. So we can do this, I'm gonna clear, I say umi slash groups here. And notice that the last group that we see, so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit to see it better. The last group that I see is mandatory label slash high mandatory level. So it means that I am a high integrity level because I'm running as an administrator, sort of. Now, if we want to make sure that a file is only read by a certain integrity level, we can change the minimum integrity level that we need. So we can say, for example, we can set the integrity level of the file test.txt to high with the following command. So we take this, we put it here, but of course we have to change we have to change the name of the file. It is not test, it is please.txt. So this is the command to change the integrity level. And then we press OK. And notice now that we change it. So if you do ICAX, we have a new mandatory label, which is high mandatory label. Of course, we can actually, we are we are at that level, so we can read it. But if we were a user with a lower integrity level, we wouldn't be able to read it if uh, we did not have this high mandatory level. Now, notice that previously we did not have this mandatory label, so it means that there was no integrity level uh, built in, sort of, but now we have added it, and so, like, we have added a new check. So sometimes it might happen that you have technically the rights to read the file, to do stuff with the file, however, you do not have the integrity level required, so be careful about that. And so discover this extra mechanism called MIC, and then this also let us talk about the user account control, UAC. Now, UAC is a Windows security feature that once again is added on top of everything else to protect the operating system. So the idea is that most applications and tasks are run with standard user privileges, even if the user launching them is an administrator. So this security feature is similar to the other, but has to do with least privilege. So the idea is that we want things to run with the least privileges required, because if a program does not technically need administrator, we don't want to run it as an administrator, because if it runs as administrator and it is compromised during its run, then we compromise the entire system. So a better idea would be, okay, let's segregate the application, let's make sure that each, each task, each process, runs with the minimum level of privileges so that even if it is compromised it will not compromise the entire system but only a part of the system and with enough segregation on this case in this context we can make our system way more robust and the concept of least privilege is implemented with this user account control so specifically after a successful authentication, an administrator account, an administrative user, actually obtains two access tokens, not one. The first one is a standard user token, which is used to perform all non-privileges operations, 
This is sometimes called filtered admin token. And the second token instead is a regular administrator token that is used only when the user wants to perform a privilege operation. So to leverage the administrator token, a WAC consent prompt needs to be confirmed. So you have a prompt, a specific prompt that says, look, do you really want to launch this application as administrator? And so the system knows that it has to use the administrator token. Of course, I'm not sure about this, but probably it is the case. All of this stuff can be configured by changing some key in the Windows registry, which is an internal database that governs how Windows is run and configured. But the idea is that in a secure system, you have this sort of extra control on top of everything else that change how checks are made. So this is it for this video. To give a quick recap, we talk about, in general, authentication, authorization, and session management. We discuss the way that security principles, which are the entities that authenticate and that do stuff on Windows operating system, are identified. So the SID, the security identifier, and here we gave some example. For example, this one is a SID, this one is a SID. So if you see stuff like this, do not be afraid because it is a very simple structure. We have a bunch of information at the start, we have the identifier for the domain, and we have the identifier for the local entity within that domain, which can be either a user or a group. Then we talk about the concept of an access token, which implements the idea of session. We talk about file permission that we can check with the command iCalcs, and we can also set with the same command. We talk about the mandatory integrity control, so we have four integrity levels, system high, medium, low, so be careful about the integrity level. And finally, we talk about the user access control, which is another mechanism to protect Windows. And so this is it for this video. I will link all the references that I use to study for this stuff here about security identifiers, access tokens, mandatory integrity controls, file permissions, and also some blog posts on playing with Windows API for those interested. Now, I understand that this video was extremely theoretic and probably heavy. I am sorry for that, but with Windows, there's no getting around that. Windows is just much more complex than Linux for a series of reasons, some of which I don't understand honestly. But the idea is that now, with all this concept, we can not only do the attacks themselves, not only showcase the exploitation techniques, but we have a conceptual ground to understand what is happening underneath. We don't need to know all the details, but some understanding is important to understand, okay, like this is not magic. The way we do the exploit is because of all these underlying mechanisms that implement how authentication, authorization, and session management work in Windows operating systems. So having said all of this, I hope the video was still somehow enjoyable. If it was so, please leave feedback in the comment and see you to the next video. Thank you for watching and for your attention.